Welcome, everyone, to the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Our guest today is former Major League Baseball pitcher Micah Bowie. Micah is 44 years old, made his Major League Baseball debut July 24th, 1999, and last appeared in a game in April of 2008. He played in 1999 with the Braves and Cubs. From 2002 to 2003, was with the Athletics. 2006 to 2007, with the Washington Nationals. In 2008, he was with the Colorado Rockies. But Micah's story and the reason he's joining us here on the podcast uh, is not to talk baseball, although baseball intersects with the story that's being told. Because as a result of his baseball career, Micah has had to receive back surgery. And that back surgery resulted in severe lung damage, where less than 10% of his lungs are functioning. And as of January of this year, 2019, he is in the fight of his life. Uh, The MLBPA has denied benefits for him. He's literally 20 days short of a 25-man roster, the experience he needed to be on the 25-man roster to qualify. Every day, uh, Micah requires oxygen therapy in order to stay alive. And indeed, that was what was happening today. Uh, I was alerted to this this story yesterday. Uh, When I say yesterday, that was January 28th, a Monday. The Washington posted a story on him on January 27th, which I think is what prompted some of the people in my circle to um, let me know about the story. And I was connected to Micah fairly quickly through people in our ministry with Sports Spectrum, first of all, to pray for him, which I hope we will all do, but then to see if uh, he would do an interview. And I think it was really Micah who wanted to do this kind of interview to get his story out, but also to really have people hear the hope that he has in about as bad a circumstance from a human perspective as we can look at a person who's really suffering and in the fight of his life. Uh, And when you hear this interview, I think you'll hear a man who has completely put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord. And it's an encouraging interview as much as it is a sad interview as well. Um, But take a listen. Take a listen to Micah Bowie's story. It's an important one I think a lot of people need to hear. The 44-year-old former Major League Baseball pitcher joins us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Micah, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Micah, it's it's uh, interesting how our paths crossed, and I really hadn't known about your story, which I'm sure many hadn't for the last few weeks that aren't close to you, uh, until some of the stories came out with, through the Washington Post and other outlets, Yahoo Sports, about the fight of your life that you're in right now uh, and have been for a little while. For those who don't know, let's start there and sh- share with our audience exactly what has transpired and what's been going on and, and, and how you're doing. Well, as, uh, when I played baseball, of course, I got drafted in 93 and I got done playing in 2008. And uh, when you play baseball, uh, a lot of times, you know, you, you leave the game, but the injuries stay behind with you, you know, or you take the injuries with you. And, and uh, so... Uh, my end and my back and, and some things were, were messed up from baseball. But uh, once I got done, I was hoping, you know, they'd get better with, without the daily grind of baseball on them. Um, but they did not. And, and some things progressed along. And uh, eventually we uh, had to have a surgery to try to make things better. Um, got a spinal cord stimulator put in mm-hmm. um, to help kind of control pain in your back. Um, I need some fusions as well. But that was kind of the, the first surgery to – um, start controlling the pain and, and, uh, to start preparing for, for the next things coming. And, uh, anyway, I had the surgery and about the first month went, went great. I was pretty excited. Um, and then one night, uh, I was laying in bed and it moved the battery, which they put inside you. It's connected to two wires to your spine. And, um, that battery, uh, as they put it in there, it decided to, uh, migrate and, uh, it damaged my liver diaphragm and my right lung. So uh, I've got a scar about the size of the battery through my, the center of my right lung, um, puncture my right lung, and hit the liver as well. Because when they put them in, they, they, when they go up, that there's only important things for them to go through. And so uh, we went through a process at that point. Um, first of, uh, of, you know, hey, what happened? I can't breathe. I felt a sharp pain. I knew something was wrong immediately. I couldn't breathe. Um, it was pretty rough. We went to see the 
the docs and stuff. And, uh, you know, first you're like, well, hey, everything's fine. You know, maybe you got another issue going on here. And so we just kind of went round and round, back and forth, back and forth. And uh, it just kept getting worse and worse. And um, the next thing you know, I'm, I'm in the ER and, and the doctor there is like, hey, you know, they've, they've got to move this thing. This thing's causing problems. And uh, that thing was moving around the whole time, kind of creating damage inside, banging into organs and, and stuff uh, hmm. and doing its thing. So uh, eventually they removed it, but they didn't do anything about the damage. And so it continued to degrade and uh, ended up going on medical oxygen in December 2016 and um, went through a, a, a lot of a lot of different doctors, hospitals, and really trying to figure this thing out to, to get fixed. And, uh, and then fortunately we were able to get to a doctor and we were able to get fixed. And I had a, a couple chest surgeries within a month uh, called thoracotomies. And um, they went in and repaired the diaphragm and, and put some mesh in there and uh, fixed some things and uh, retracted some lung and different things like that. And, you know, it, it, was a, it, was, it was fixed to a point. I was, uh, my lungs, the damage was done. Um, they weren't going to come back. So I was stuck on oxygen. Um, I was uh, not able to breathe very well. Uh, my, my chest muscles obviously were were all repaired and kind of sewed together and very tight. And I still have the back injuries, those things that are still there. And uh, but we were moving along. And you know, at this point, I was like, "Hey, God, thank you. You know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not great. You know, I'm never going to be. I'm never going to." You know, go snowboard down a mountain again or wakeboard behind a boat or play golf again. But, you know, I was getting to a point where uh, it, it wasn't killing me too bad. I was able to breathe on the oxygen. We were able to walk some. And, you know, I, I could, I could sit, at, sit at a meal with my family and, and do some stuff. And it wasn't, it wasn't great compared to being a major league baseball player. But also it was, um, <laughs> let's say it was, it was a dramatic change. But, you know, in my life I've always known that uh god is in charge and it's his way not mine so hmm. uh so so i was like okay god so i'm um, going to make some adjustments and do things different and, uh you know we had gone on for about a year or so after the last surgery and trying to improve and and things and get better and and, and then all of a sudden it just started getting tighter you know it gets tighter and tighter and you know you tell the doctors and they're like well sorry we're not gonna you know do, do anything for that you know just, uh, you know, keep on going. And, yeah. um, you know, if you ever get into to permanent pain or different things like that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult now for doctors to manage things with, with opioid crisis and different things going on. Right. But, uh, you know, the doctors kind of go, well, no, we're not, we're not doing anything for it. And so, uh, a little bit later this year, it was getting worse. We went to see the surgeon that, uh, had done the surgery and he's like, Hey, um, I can see these little blue lines on my chest. He said, Hey, you're tearing the sutures. I mean, you, you've got to slow down. We, we need to get these muscle spasms under control. Go talk to your doctor. And so we would go back and forth. And, um, uh, about four months later after that, or five months after that, it got worse and worse. And then December 22nd, the, the spasm started. My diaphragm started cramping, pulling real hard. And, uh, over the next six, seven days, uh, Two of the couple at home, oxygen started bottoming out into the 70s, which uh, oxygen should be 95 to 97, 98, 99 all the time. Um, when you get down into the 80s, it's kind of a dangerous level. When you're in the 70s, it's, it's not very good. Yeah. Um, so uh, they rushed me to the hospital and spent another four or five days going through that. And, uh, you know, we're kind of back in the position that we've been in before where um, it's messed back up again. We've you know, uh, going through it, the address has taken me a number of times the first time through. Um, and so, so we kind of know where we're at on this. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to, to get to this point as we go through a lot of those things right there. And, um, you know, I have to sit there and re- rely on second Corinthians 12, nine, a lot. My grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Mm. And, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's a transition that, you know, it's not something that, that I would have ever could have foreseen, hoped, or could have thought could have happened. Um, it's not something that's, that's happened a lot that we know of. It's not something that's very common. Um, as far as we know, it's not happened to anybody else. And so it's, uh, it's definitely been a, an interesting, uh, challenge and has, uh, obviously had its repercussions with, with my family and, and, you know, keeping dad alive as long as we can and doing what we can to keep him there. 
So, you know, we've been fortunate enough. I'm home from the hospital and we've seen a number of other doctors, but I'm um, going high amount of oxygen per minute. Uh, you know, I'm still 24 seven, but yeah. uh, my condition is, it's just, it, it's, it is where it is at this point physically. So did they, a couple questions off of that. So is there, I don't even know if I like you asking this, but I guess we got it. Is there a prognosis to this or is it just kind of like how much you can stand, how much you can tolerate, or is there actually hope that there can be some kind of improvement going forward? Um, well, uh, I have, to, to be a hundred percent honest with you, my hope is in the Lord. Yeah. Um, medically with your, with your diaphragm ruptured, um, you know, day, babies come out with, with, with a ruptured diaphragm. Um, it's something uh, doctors have to repair immediately at birth. Um, it's, it's, it's not some, it's not a muscle you can do uh, without very well. No. Uh, with, with your diaphragm, that, that's the, basically it's the wall between everything up top and everything down low. And, and when that wall is broken, um, you're broken. What happens is uh, for your air to get out of the air we breathe to get – into your lungs and to go from to, for your body to take the oxygen out of that air first and then take that oxygen and put it into the blood as a chemical reaction. And your body has to have what you call some negative pressure to help that process. And uh, when your diaphragm is ruptured, that positive pressure that's below that wall invades that negative pressure and uh, it makes your lungs not work very well. Mm. And so the worse your lungs work, obviously – the more damage you take, the less oxygen, the more your body takes its hold, and then eventually, um, you know, it goes where it goes. Yeah. So there's not a there's 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 not a lot on it. There's um for now there's some uh, some stem cell research going on that uh, we're looking into and have been reached out to about to possibly uh, do some things with stem cells to repair some areas to to get more function back. Um, you know, surgically at this time. There's there's not a surgery that that the doctors uh, at our hospital are ready to pursue. They they want to do some some more studies and look at some things and and really try to to get a big grasp of, of what what all the factors are now. Especially since you know once you've had a a big chest surgery and uh, once that surgery ruptures messes up everything kind of goes haywire in there. Um, the doctors you know it's really hard for them to want to go back in because they don't know what they're going to see. And they, they don't know what to prepare for before the surgery. And, and plus, you know, it's risky. And those are things that, you know, you know we know. Um, but, you know, for them to go in, the, the number of doctors, and a lot of a lot of thoracic surgeons say, uh, you know, a diaphragm surgery is the hardest surgery they can do mm-hmm. because it involves every element of your, your, your heart, your lungs, uh, your, your stomach, your liver. It, it's, everything's incorporated into that one surgery. And so... Uh, so, so there's a there's a lot to it. So, um, you know, right now the prognosis from uh, the prognosis over Christmas was until you can find someone to fix this, and you're gonna you're gonna die. Yeah. And we've gone through that once already, and so that's why we're really thankful after it was fixed the first time. Um, now, after this has happened again, it's uh, it's. Only God knows what's going to happen next. Yeah. And so I know that God is there, and, and He can, and He can do whatever He needs to do. And, and I'm, I'm confident that the good Lord wants me to be healed, or if He wants things to go better, if He wants things to be done, I guarantee you, it, He can make that happen. And so you know, and 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 my my hope is in that. And so and I, and He can either get us to the right doctors. I would, you know, we're praying we can get to the right doctors and do some things to do that. But, uh, you know, right now, this is, you know, we're kind of in a holding pattern just to see how I degrade. Micah, the the Washington Post did a piece on you just a few days ago. Uh, Yahoo Sports, about a week ago or so, wrote something and a few others. This has become a public story, obviously, over the last couple of weeks or so. And the, the key to this story in a lot has been that the MLBPA, as far as I've read, has denied the full benefits because you were... 20 days short, 20 days of qualifying for the 25-man roster experience that was needed. Um, first of all, is that accurate? And second of all, why, what's, 
What has that process been like to try and get some benefits and be able to alleviate some of the costs? Because I have to imagine the cost for this is, is quite expensive to treat. So in dealing with the uh, the MLBPA, the union that I played for and was a part of, um, the, I applied for uh, disability benefits from the union. And what those are is that they're, they're uh, um, uh, you've got your 10-year players' benefits, which are 200 and some thousand dollars now, and then you've got disability benefits that are a, a very small amount relative to um, – what goes on with with what they pay guys, yeah. but it it is it is a it is it's a small amount in comparison to that, but it would be enough to um, help alleviate some of those issues with medical bills and different things and the, the way things have piled up. Um, but but I, I did apply for with uh, the union and they denied my benefits, and so I went through the appeals process, um, especially since my injuries are directly related to playing major league baseball. Uh, if I hadn't hurt my back playing baseball and I had to pitched through and gone through all of those issues while playing baseball. Uh, I, I never would have had this surgery and I wouldn't have needed the other surgeries we could never have now. Um, Cause I wouldn't have had the, the, the multiple disc issues from throwing a baseball. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, we, we reached out and I was like, Hey, this is all directly related to my time playing. Um, and we have the records and have everything. And I gave it to them and, um, and there's, there's the pitching committee and, uh, so once I was denied initially, I went back and I did some research. So I sent in an appeal to them and followed through the process um, because there is the board. Uh, there's a pension committee that, that is supposed to look at, you know, all the elements of what's going on. And uh, they've got the final say, the say so on who gets benefits and who doesn't. And so uh, we went through that process. And uh, once uh, it was about a year long process and we, we got to the end of it and, um, uh, I had called and, uh, the representative that I spoke to, uh, I called the union and said, Hey, my benefits just got denied. Who can I talk to? And they're like, Oh my goodness. And then they had me call and I talked to the representative and, um, he said, Hey, I just, Hey, I said, hi, I'm Mike Abu. He said, Hey, I'm so and so. Hey, I, Oh, I, I know your name. I just denied your benefits. Hmm. And I said, well, I'm calling to ask about that. Why? And, uh, I got just kind of a, well, the attorney said we could. He said, I did, just, did you not look at the case? Did you not look at it's because of baseball? Did you not look at the history, the injuries, the training reports, the, the, the doctor's reports, uh, everything that's sent in? And it was, well, no, I didn't, I didn't even look at it. They just said we could deny it. So I did. Hmm. And I said, so why do we have a pension board? You know, what are, what is your, you guys role? Because, um, they have some authority to do some things if they so choose. Um, and not just with me. There, there's, there's, there's the 1980s players, the pre-1980s guys. There's a lot of guys that have, uh, been left out going through these agreements. And, you know, a lot of the players don't realize they're currently playing that they're going to get injured. And when baseball is over, that injury doesn't go away. And uh, they're going to realize later, like I, I have realized now that, um, you know, the union turned me down and, you know, they want you to, to play and get out there and we do. And, and they protect a lot of guys that do a lot of things um, that I never chose to do. But yet, whenever you get down to it, as you're coming into it, uh, it's, uh, you know, I think they can do a much better job at, at taking care of the players. And because, you know, you, you, you know you're going to go out there and, and it's tough on the body. and You know you're, you're a professional athlete and you're going to push yourself. Um, but whenever you're done playing, those guys, when you're in there while you're playing, they're going, yes, we're going to take care of you. Yes, yes, there's this year. Yes, if this happens. And then afterwards, um, you know, I would hope that our, our fate with, with those guys and the uh, reliability of, of issues that we bring to them, you know, would get – a little bit more of a look from the players who are there to support the players and who are there to try to help the players because it's a very strong union. And the years that I was through there helped support the process for the current players to be making uh, the amount of money. Um, Cause when I started in 1993, the, the, the minimum was I think a hundred, hundred eight thousand dollars and it stayed that way through the nineties pretty much uh, 
through my first year. And then, you know, now it's gone just in a decade, you know, they had gone up to half a million dollars yeah. and it's been that way for a while. And, and, and the guys have done well and I want them to do well. Um, but I think the players need to know that, you know, our union needs to be there for us as, as players to keep us out of this forum. You know, I did, I didn't want to share my story initially. That wasn't really what is. So, so people had, had kind of contacted me understanding some of the things that were going on with our life. And this is a story isn't one I wanted to share. Yeah. Um, because I felt, uh, there would not be a need that, and, uh, and it's come down to it that there's more to the story. And, uh, and so I decided to speak up because I pray that regardless of what happens with me, you know, we don't know how long I've got or if I'm, what's going to happen with me. But, you know, I, I pray as, as guys are coming through that, you know, they can enact change because the, the pension plan is one thing about baseball. Uh, the, the union has done very well. They, they have a, a very large pension plan. Um, and, and in general, they always put out more in that they get more money in from the teams than they spend in benefits, at least this last year. And so it's not about something they have a three plus billion dollar nest egg yeah. um, of, of cash. So it's not something that, that they're awash, but you know, it's hard for me to see how they're, they're stockpiling those funds and not using them for the players because the teams are giving them the money to help the players. Yeah. And it's some of the guys on the current positions and some of the guys that have been there that are choosing not to use the funds for what they're for. Micah, that's very difficult to listen to and hear. Um, but I wonder, since this has gone public, especially through the Post, the Washington Post, Yahoo Sports, and, and others, and maybe this podcast, certainly this podcast will get out your story of faith, which is important and, and probably the most important thing that we can talk about. But I wonder yes. what type of response you've gotten, if at all, from people, whether it's from the MLB or MLBPA, or maybe it's from teammates, former teammates, people who've read this, uh, story, uh, it's even just a couple days ago from the Washington Post, have you heard it from anyone or received any kind of feedback or encouragement um, at all? Know, as, a, as a major league baseball player, I, I was an athlete. Um, I was able to, to throw a baseball very hard. I worked hard. I was able to, to, to do kind of anything I wanted to do. Um, I, and I was, I, was, I was a strong person. I wasn't very, I was weak. Um, but I've learned something. Uh, in my weakness, he is strong. Hmm. and the Lord's strength has been shown through the people. Ah, sorry. That's okay. Who, 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 his strength is shown through the people that have reached out to help me and my family. Sorry about that. It's okay. It's, uh, it's overwhelming to know uh, it's overwhelming to know that there are those that are willing to to give and to help those in need. And and we have been uh, reached out to by so many people. Um, the Association of Professional Baseball Players of America um, is a, it's been around for a long time, and they've helped players quietly in the, in the, in the back for years, uh, for, I guess almost a hundred years now. And, uh, they instantly reached out to me and, and, and they're helping me and my family. And, they, you know, they, they put money in our bank account the next day. They're, they're working on getting medical treatment, stem cell treatment. They're, they're, they're doing, uh, amazing things, trying to help players, uh, very quietly. Um, they're kind of, uh, they're one of the groups that picks up the pieces of players' lives. That, uh, you know, we all see the guy that, that plays 10 years and does well, and I want him to, and I want everyone to be that guy, but yeah. the majority of baseball players don't play very long, and, and, and um, that's an organization that's been there for a long time to help pick up the piece of the players' lives when the game's over, the, the stories you don't read, the story like mine. And uh, they reached out right away. Uh, a baseball assistance team um, was set out by Major League Baseball to help players. They've uh, they, they've reached out and are, are, are jumping in to, to do what they can, and um, and, and so there's a few of those organizations, but the biggest thing is the people. Yeah. The, the people have been amazing. And so, and you know, this isn't a story you want to tell people, Hey, I'm almost died a few times, all this, you know, you know, and, and these things right there, but it's, 
and yeah. so encouraging to your faith when you see God's family pull together and you see a community form. And that to me is, uh, you know, something had this not happened, I would never have gotten to experience. And so there, there, there is, there are things that, that God uses suffering for. Yeah. Um, they're suffering throughout the world. I know that they're suffering in the Bible. They're, they're suffering, and a lot of people are really suffering. And uh, and so, but but through that suffering, um, great things can happen, and and there can be, you know, good things can come from suffering. And suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who's been given to us. And, you know, and I see that, and I see, you know, God at work, even through these circumstances. And, uh, and I can't thank everyone enough for, for, for getting this story out and, uh, and being, and being willing to say, hey, you know, here's, here's something that's going on and, and give, give us an opportunity to tell our story. Um, I hadn't said anything for, for about a year and a half. Oh, uh, into this thing, or two actually two and a half years into this thing. This is the third year, almost we're going into almost year four yeah. of dealing with this. Um, and going, so after three years, and God had been kind of putting it on my heart, said, "Hey, I want you to speak up. I want you to speak up." And I just, I was like, "Okay, I will," you know. And then uh, this last time in the hospital, and my oxygen is down in the seventies. My, my family's around me um, as as we're going through waiting to see if I survive the next spasm. Um, yeah. God said speak. And that's what I've done. And we're grateful you're speaking, Micah. And I know a lot of people that are listening to this um, probably have some questions on how they can help. And I don't even know if there is a way, maybe offline we can discuss and I can have people just reach out to us. Jason at sportspectrum.com is my email. But is there a way if somebody's interested in wanting to help, certainly praying is the first thing we're all going to do. But is there another way? Our family. Uh, you know, the, the, we have uh, the Association of Professional Baseball Players of America. Um, we have asked if, if people wanted to donate or do anything um, that they could donate through them. Uh, okay. There's no GoFundMe. There's, there's nothing like that. But um, they're helping with a lot of the medical and different things, and and uh, and also. So so we've asked that if people do want to donate, we wanted to go through them because I'm not the only I'm not the only guy out there that's that that that's had things happen. I'm not the only person that has been put into a rough situation. I'm definitely not the only person that's had a messed up surgery ruin their life. Right. Uh, at least the life that, that I had previously. My life is not a ruin. My hope is in Christ. My life is in the Lord. And, and there can be joy and suffering, but uh, definitely changed my perception of what life is. Hmm. And uh, and many things can be done uh, through this. And, 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 my, and my prayer is that through my story that we can alert people to those that are hurting that need help that uh, that can't access somebody to tell their story so that you know we may we may be able to make a difference in their lives right. um, there's many many a, a former player's uh, wife when they pass away uh, survivors benefits weren't passed on to uh, pre 1980s players uh, they didn't have a certain amount of time and, and so a lot of uh, players, as they're passing away, their wives are losing their houses because there's no the benefits don't continue to pass on, and so we have a lot of baseball wives out there that are that are suffering as well, and you know they're losing their homes, and uh, and, and I just don't think, uh, you know, I don't think that's what our pastime. I love baseball. I think it's the greatest game in the world. It really is. But I think it can do a much better job in helping and taking care of those that have given so much to the game. And, and, and that's kind of my prayer that maybe through this we can get baseball to do a better job of taking care of those that sacrifice their bodies and their lives and their time so that, that we can help those families out as well so that, uh, that this story doesn't have to get ever published again. Yeah. Michael, last question. I really appreciate your time here. I know that, um, 
that this isn't easy on all levels. But let me ask you from a faith perspective, you talk a lot about your faith in Christ and how it's been your rock. And that's so encouraging to me. And I know so many others that listen to this show. Tell me about what God has taught you during this entire battle, what his biggest lesson for you is, or what the biggest um, nugget that you can come and take away from what you've grown in your relationship with the Lord and what he's taught you during this time. Um, you can sum up on easy in Job. Um, God tells Job, um, when you, he makes a covenant with Job, and he says, when you pray for your friends, basically, I'm paraphrasing here, and I, uh, uh, so don't don't crucify me if I get this all wrong. But <laughs> when you pray for pray for your friends, I will put your your I will ha- put your life back on track on the right path. Hmm. And that doesn't mean that you're going to be what you were. But God's got a God's got a plan, and He's got a reason. And uh, and it's through my story and, and through the you know I didn't I didn't cause it. I'm not the one that put the thing in wrong. I'm not the, I'm not the one that messed up. I'm not this. I didn't, I didn't ask to be injured. I was doing the best I could to stay as healthy and be as strong as I could, as long as I could. But it's through, you know, people are affected by adverse circumstances all the time. And so coming through that, you know, uh, the biggest thing I've learned is that God has given me an opportunity to reach out to others in need, you know, dealing with this, you're mm-hmm. dealing with uh, pain and pain management. And there's big topics you know, going on in the media about opioids and People getting their medications and dealing with pain and how that's handled. And, and we've firsthand been going through that. And uh, it, it's been unbelievable how rough it can be for people to get what they're needing for me to get and they're hurting. And I pray that we can bring light to some of these issues because uh, I don't want their suffering to be for nothing. And I don't want people to suffer. And, and, and I know a lot of people are, and, and I want, through this to be able to help reach out and, 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 and tell them that, you know, that God's there just because we're hurting doesn't mean he's not there. And, and we can learn through the suffering and, and God's, uh, I tell everyone, all things work for the good of those called according to his purpose. Yeah. And so no matter what I'm going through, I know it needs to work for the good of God's purpose, not Micah's purpose. And so that's kind of where our heart's at Yeah. on it. Micah Bowie, uh, thank you for sharing your story and being willing and vulnerable to come on. And I really believe encourage a lot of people who are listening in their faith to stay strong, uh, even when tough times come. And we're all praying for you, my friend, and wish you nothing but the best and believe in that, um, like you said, the Lord's got a, a great big plan in place for you, whether, wh- however it turns out. And so we'll be praying for you, my friend, and, and thank you for joining us here on the podcast. Thank you very much for the time. And many thanks to Micah Bowie, the former Major League Baseball pitcher, 44 years old, in the fight of his life, for joining us. Thank you, Micah, for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum podcast and i gotta tell you when you hear a story like that and you still hear a joy and a peace that passes all understanding coming from him as he's going through this and you hear the emotion obviously in the outpouring of people who've reached out to him but he referenced romans eight twenty eight and second corinthians 12 9 and certainly the story of job and it just encourages me Um, and I hope it encourages you as well as a a follower of Christ. And if you're not a follower of Christ and you wonder what that's all about, Micah is a living proof that suffering comes to all of us, and yet God is bigger than that. And there's peace, and a peace that surpasses all understanding that can be found only in Christ. So we pray for Micah. We pray for his family. Lord, thank you for this opportunity for Micah to share his story, for Micah to share about you and using this platform to point people back to you, Jesus. Uh, We thank you for this opportunity. We pray for healing for Micah. We pray that you would heal his body, Lord, and that you would give wisdom to doctors to find a cure and to help him be delivered from this, Lord. Uh, Yet your will be done, and your plan is perfect, and we believe that, and we trust in that, and so does Micah. We lift up Micah's family to you. 
Lord, just comfort them and be with them, Lord. God, just be the center of their lives. We trust you, we love you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.